Like you should care if, you know, if you're putting kittens in bins and setting the bins on fire, care what people think about you. But if you're just trying to help others, fuck what that other guy says who's trying to bring you down. Like if you're doing something positive, there will only be, here's the thing. It's real easy to try and drag someone down rather than pull yourself up. Real easy. It's the, the lazy man's method of not having to improve themselves is trying to drag everyone else down to their level. Um, and it's a real easy thing to get rid of as well. If you've got friends who, here's one. You know when you say, you know Dave? Yeah, he's all right some of the time, isn't he? Right? So for the, some of the time he's not all right, he's a dick? Yeah, pretty much. So why are you even hanging around with him then? Like, why is he even in your life? Get rid of Dave. Like, lose him from your life. He's a, like, if somebody doesn't bring positive to your world, cut them out. We are here with Lex Griffin, all the way from England. All the way. All the way. He's come just for us. G'day, mate. I can't promise that I won't do terribly racist Scottish ac- um, um, Australian accents all the way through this, by the way. You can't be yeah. racist to Australians. I think, I think we talk shit on ourselves more than anyone else. So um, you can give it your best shot. So um, tell us to start off with why, why you're in Australia. So I'm out here to see the happiest man in Australia, which is Nathan who is grinning over there as we speak. Yeah, pretty much. We're just having some bromance time, doing some fun stuff, creating some content and getting a break from the the gray and the storms. It's pretty, pretty storm. You've had the bad storms, but let's be honest. Have you had the cold minus four degree weather with it? No. So what are you complaining about? You just, you can sit here and you little gray skies being warm, (laughs) moaning all you like. Yeah. I got off that plane and you were like, oh, it's all devastated, Mike. And I'm like, yeah top off <laughs> yeah i was gonna say you walked off with us English. yeah <laughs> oh, i love it man i love it um so you're in australia you've done a hell of a lot of travel elsewhere um all for fitness gymshark in particular yeah they facilitated a lot of the travel especially because they, when they were growing as a brand they were doing that we were doing tons of expos because they had their place like i think they're dwindling a bit now it's less and less kind of doing it. But that's, I think it's because more because the expos got greedy with money and drove a lot of people away, which was silly of them because now it's backfiring. But at the time it was really good and it was a great way to meet people and to give single times of the year where people can kind of plan to travel to meet the people they follow online and stuff. So it was cool. Um, but I think, yeah, the uh, the expense of it, not only for the people going out, like doing the the, the, the actual stands, like all the companies got so high, but for you guys to buy tickets to go in, it was, became insane. Like, so I think now we're all facilitating other ways of getting to meet and see people, like uh, doing the, like more of the fan meet and greets and stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, and like, we were actually talking, Nathan and I, a lot of people were saying, are we gonna do a meetup while we're here? And we don't really think about doing stuff like that because it's kind of daunting, but um, yeah, we, we might like shout something out. We're, we're going to, uh, where are we going? The pretty place, oh, Byron. 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 Yeah, we might we might just do do something there, maybe. It's the place to be. You'll love it. You'll love it. Um, it's not hot here, trust me. This isn't hot compared to there. It's gonna be hot there. No, it's gonna be hot there. So I got a, I, I got I got like color on one arm yesterday from watching the boxing in the sports bar. <laughs> It was just like overcast day. Like the sunshine was just kind of like peeping through. Yeah. And hey, I got I got, I got a knobhead tan. I call it knobhead tan because you just got those big vest marks. Like I'm wearing a vest even when I've got it off now. Brilliant. I love it. I love it. So that's de- look, that's definitely something that we want to dive into is, is Gymshark because you were the very first athlete of Gymshark. But before we do, I'm, I'm really fascinated to know what – in particular, your teenage life was um, like in England and what, what it's like over there and growing up. We're all, you know, we're, we, we, get, we get drafted in to be chimney sweeps from an early age. We dance merrily in the streets. We often have talking animals, yeah. uh, houses that, you know, become magical for no reason. We go through wardrobes a lot and see there's lions, a lot of lions in wardrobes. Yeah, things like that. So it's an interesting time. <laughs> 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 Yeah, no, uh, I was the usual uh, impetuous little fella who, uh, if I didn't play enough sport, got a bit tetchy. That was, that was me, yeah. So 
uh, really good at anything like activity based as a kid, like riding bikes constantly, like coming home from school. I was talking to Nathan about this the other day, actually, because we were passing a sports field here and there were just kids doing races and everything. I was like, you know, it doesn't happen in England anymore. Like they kind of like when I was when I was in primary school, we used to have to have swimming once a week, PE once a week, and then you were part of the sports teams as well. So you go and play on a Saturday, like football, rugby, whatever it was you were doing. And now like none of it's enforced in England, and so kids are just turning into blobs, you know, because they're not being made to try to be in these team events or anything anymore. Because everyone's scared of, oh, you know, there's not even winning or losing anymore at half of these things. Ugh, don't even get me going on that. So we'll stay away from it. It makes me so mad. Like, what is wrong with losing? I lost tons of games. I'm, I'm, I'm turned to a serial killer that's been caught. So, you know, <laughs> that losing helped me become a successful serial killer, you know. Um, so, yeah, uh, I was always uh, interested. If something interested me, I was all in. But if it kind of, if, if it didn't pique my interest, I was re really tough to kind of, uh, make to be made to do that thing so um i loved science so i was always into that so uh that was a big thing and then football running like we're doing like we used to do a lot we actually had athletics so again that's dwindled a bit but i did a lot of like sprints 100 meter sprints that was my thing uh, 200 meter relays and stuff like is it 400 meter relays whatever the relay length now um that was a big part. So, and I, I was playing on every team I could play on where I got selected. So at weekends I would, I'd be playing, it'd be one of whatever sports you could get into. I'd play Saturday, one sport, Sunday, be another sport. Yeah. Uh, or I even did horse riding. Yeah. yeah. For a little bit. Yeah. Until football became more important. Did you have yeah. rugby in that? Yeah. But rugby is more of a private school, uh, sport in England. So if you're in like, um, all the mainstreams is football, but if you go to private rugby is like more prevalent, um, so I was, I went to a school which was technically, it, it wasn't, a, they call them state schools, which is like an, um, ones you don't pay to go to. And I, I got a scholarship to go to what was technically a private school, but it wasn't like a boarding school or anything like that. So it's still the same curriculum as the state schools did. It's just you wore a, a, a smarter uniform yeah. for no apparent reason and paid money to go. It just, you know, it had good science blocks and things like that as extras, but um for some reason, football was still a big sport in that school. So, yeah, rugby I played intermittently, but football and basketball were the main two, which is ironic, yeah, because I'm not a six foot dude, but yeah. um, I was point guard. Yeah. yeah, so I was the trickster. Okay. I was, yeah. Yeah, cool. And what was, um, when did, because I've uh, looked up, you had a bit of an MMA career as well. When did that, when did that come in? So, through school and everything, never never had fights, nothing. Like w even if I got into a fight, I didn't have the fight. So I wasn't that kid, I like, didn't, yeah. didn't do anything like that. I had like one incident on a Sunday league match, which was, which was um, gained just my competitiveness, getting the better of me. Like we'd lost and I was annoyed and somebody else wasn't annoyed and did something and I had an actual fight, but that was like one in however many years you were playing the thing. So yeah. I wouldn't have said I was a fighter or, or anything like that. Um, and it was when I went to uni I did a little bit of Thai boxing and boxing because it was just, so when you go to uni in England, the, uh, all the sports facilities are subsidized. So it costs you like 60 pounds or hundred pounds for the entire year yeah. for the gym. Yeah. So it was just insane. And you can go in and do whatever you wanted. And so they had a boxing guy who'd come in there just randomly who did boxing and Thai boxing. I was like, oh, I'll do some, some of those classes. So it was literally just pad classes and basic stuff. Um, and then when I came back from uni, uh, I was B I was a PT, so just to fill in the gap kind of thing to make money and decide what I wanted to do in my life. And um, b b this is how it came around. I was a PT and I started training a guy who was a doorman. Do you call him doorman over here? Security guys on the nightclubs. Oh, yeah. You're not coming in, mate. Yeah, yeah that guy. So, so, yeah, and one night they basically had a dude didn't turn up and he rang me and went, do you want to make some extra cash? You just have to stand on the door. Now I was far too pretty. <laughs> like I had like the haircut, swooshy hair. Yeah, dude, I was not a doorman. <laughs> so like I came and stood on this door and um, for the night and they basically took the piss out of me the entire night, uh, the other doorman in a, in a fun way. Cause I was 
too like tarty for this job they were all shaved heads and big lads like and um so they were just trying to pimp me out to every girl that came through the door they were like they, they were like telling him i was a model or i was this kind of guy doing this and that and i'm going that's just this like, naive little guy You're like what eh? and, you, and they're, they're like nudging me going shut up we'll get you in here <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> so I, yeah exactly yeah they were they were wingmining me even though i didn't want it like kind of thing and um so i had a great time and then they actually offered me a more work doing that because they were like they were solid lads these guys who i'd work with so they had the place locked down it was really easy um but then because of that i became friends with these door guys and a lot of them did tie boxing um so i then started doing that way more frequently to get fit and to learn how to be confident in my ability to fight that was always i didn't intend on fighting but it was always nice to be able to know how to so uh that just basically led on to at the time cage fighting was just coming through it was still called cage fighting still um it was only like four years ago kind of it came mainstream so prior to that it was known as human cock fighting in england like yeah yeah like yeah <laughs> that's they they brutalized it like they made it out to be this like vicious horrendous thing and was this when there was no rules as well no no and- there was no it was all this was when it was the cage warriors and clash of warriors like there were full federations in the thing but like they were just trying to kind of i don't know just get n- newspaper articles by gl- like glorifying the fact that it, some of the fights got quite bloody because of elbows because you know prior to this nobody seen anyone throw an elbow on somebody else for yeah. and elbows cut and, they, and head wounds bleed a lot. And they're, not half, they're never as bad as they look, but they look horrendous. So, you know, um, basically we did this, we did this, we were doing Thai boxing and then MMA was coming through and a couple of these guys set up in a dojo. They've been doing judo and all this stuff. They set up an MMA team uh, class thing. So um, some of the lads went along to that. I went with them. Turned out I was pretty good at the ground wrestling and picked up some stuff quickly. They, after a couple of months, were like, there's a t- you know, amateur tournament coming up. Have a go, have a go. I said, no, 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 I'm not interested in it. Have a go, have a go. <laughs> and they, they kind of went, turned me down and ended up, winning, ended up winning it. Anyway, I just kicked my way to victory, basically. Yeah. Couldn't walk for three days afterwards because my legs swelled up so much because I'd just been, because it was an amateur one, you couldn't kind of do, um, there were limits, like you couldn't strike to the head on the ground and stuff like that. So basically, I was just whipping knees and legs and kicking anything I could kick because they were all judo guys in these tournaments and they didn't like it at all. So yeah, kicked my way through that, and uh, that was it. Then I was kind of a bit, a little bit addicted, and just kept slowly edging my way up through, and just did a lot of fighting in the local scene, and then up through, up and down the country. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What was? Because I've seen that video. Actually, <laughs> ruthless. Uh, yeah, pretty full on. But you're in killer shape when you were in that ring. So yeah. your training before moving into MMA was it was it bodybuilding yeah bodybuilding. Was, yeah 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 because yeah. when I when I went to uni I started playing oh that was it so when I went to uni I started playing rugby more than football I didn't play football at uni at all I did American football and rugby because yeah and my um the, my housemates were from private schools some of them so they were big into rugby so they would drag me along to the trials and um, you know I was always been quick and I'm good with my hands I play basketball so I can jump run do that well and that translates really easy into a wingman in rugby so I played like outside I played outside center or wing or one one game at fullback never again because you're just a trouncing pad for forwards they do they run they break that line and they run at you with glory in their eyes and behind them all you can hear is i need a hero as they're running at you and you just think right which shoelace shall i tie myself up in (laughs) yeah just hit low and hope you tangle up in their legs and bring them down yeah but I did get my best try ever from fullback. I got it from inside our own try line, came right around the outside and up the left wing all the way to the other end. Off a kick, return? Uh, right. No, off a, off a scrum. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right on our own try line. Yeah, yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, yeah, it was a good one. They didn't expect me to be as quick as I was because I didn't think I had the ball at that point. And I obviously, I look a lot stockier than I weigh. So I'm, I'm actually a lot lighter. So when I was fighting in MMA, I was only fighting at 70 kilos, which is like 155 pounds. I think yeah yeah man yeah and I didn't cut weight either I didn't cut weight I was only ever two to four pounds over my fight weight at all times so yeah I never did the saunas or water cutting or anything I literally just dropped the four or five pounds I needed to I am well currently I'm about 186 pounds do you need it in kilos do you do kilos what's that in kilos divide it by 2.2 85 is it we worked out the other day yeah 85 kilos so I'm 15 kilos heavier there i would have probably walked around at 72 to 74 
and obviously would have dropped between yeah at the most i would have dropped eight pounds over a fight camp kind of thing but um i actually am heavier now over the last few weeks because i haven't been able to box because i've uh according to my trigger point he's meant to be a therapist but he's a torturer um yeah he, uh, he said i've developed a bit of tendonitis in my upper bicep connection under the shoulder oh. just it's because uh, we released all my shoulder from an impingement it uh i then went back to training thinking everything was fixed because everything felt nice and loosey-goosey so i was like oh cool everything's fixed let's do twice as much so i went straight yeah and i went straight back in so i was doing lifting and then just went straight back to boxing as well but full on like heavy bag work five days a week uh some like pad work and stuff and it just ground it like it just went ah nah um so i've developed a bit of tendonitis on that attachment so i have to let that kind of ease down a bit so i haven't been able to do any boxing properly it was like a 12 weeks i couldn't do a, i couldn't do it and i've only been able to just go back to bag work last week so i've put on seven or eight pounds because i've just been lifting and my body goes straight back into bodybuilder mode quite quickly like when you just lift and i'm obviously not burning the you know six to a thousand calories doing the bag work that i would be yeah so i maybe i heard it wrong but there was a tournament where you had five fights in a day that was that amateur one yeah yeah it was just like iron man yeah winner stays on kind of job like that's why I couldn't walk for three days afterwards. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 I thought I thought that might have been the case. So was it, did you win all five? It was like it depends however many started. We either had I either had four or five fights that day. Yeah, I can't remember now how many it was, but yeah, it was like four or five fights. Yeah. And I think there were like three rounds, three 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 two or three three minute rounds, something like that. Yeah. 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 But it was all like when fighting was super raw, when ev- you, everyone was like one thing you were like either a thai guy a judo dude or wrestler you know and you had bits of others but you were mainly one thing so it was just yeah it was just uh look at the draw there wasn't another good thai guy there that could have whooped me at kicking <laughs> yeah um yeah so at this time you were at uni when you were so this was just after i got back from uni yeah and you studied nutrition so yeah i did uh biology straight biology because it interests me, like I said before, like if it doesn't interest me, I'm kind of like, meh. Yeah, so I'm, I'm great like at physical stuff, but I have the attention span of a cocker spaniel. Like, so we all have our good and bad points, yeah. uh, you know? So, we're, we're, we're not, you know, you see us on uh, social media and everything, doing all this great stuff. And, well, look how successful he is. Trust me, there are many, many things I can't do. Nathan's finding that out on a daily basis. Yeah. Like, can't get, I can't be anywhere on time ever. I lose everything. Like you put me in a four by four room with nothing else in it but me, I'll still lose my keys. Like it's just, <laughs> it's just, and, and, and but we've, I've actually had um, myself looked at and I actually have a form of ADD, um, which a lot of people don't realize ADD think, they think people, kids just think, they think it's like crazy kids running around. But there's, it's like, a, there's a full spectrum of it. So I have this thing called hyperfocus. And it's like a disconnect between the front and the rear of the brain. So it's like focus versus time management. So mine don't link. So if I'm focused on one thing, I have no concept of how long it's taken me to focus on that, that thing, which is great creatively if I'm trying to edit something. Because yeah. I can sit and edit a picture for eight hours and not realize. Like literally, I've done that. It's retarded. Yeah, that's not great for time management. Sure. But in terms of if you need to dial in and do something, it's a benefit to me. But for other people around me, it's, her- it's, it's the most annoying thing in the world. So, yeah, yeah, super, yeah. Like, I once spent six, six hours looking for a color green. Because I was, yeah, because yeah, I was, like, doing my own clothing line and I had this specific green that I wanted. So I went through color palettes for six hours just looking at greens and then found my green and then they made it with a different one anyway. <laughs> but that's, like, so there's this, there's these, like... um Everyone, everyone has great and good and bad points, but sometimes you can even make a bad point a benefit to your path if you follow the path that you interest you. And the reason it interests you is because your good points focus towards that path. So, so um, I've learned that in life that if something, if you if if you don't like doing something, stop like it's a waste of your time because if you don't like it you're not going to put your energy into it and clearly if you don't like it it's because you're not not really built probably not built that way mentally or physical whatever it is to do that thing so like i'm not built to do in physical side i'm not built to do five by five training i've done it enjoyed it in terms of i've seen success from it and it does work but then it breaks me like three months down the line 
part one joint will 100% break because I've just got these tiny little 12 year old girl joints. And that's just how I am. Like, and I can cry, I can like moan about it or just not care and do what I'm good at, which is like high volume, high intensity stuff, which is going to get me the same thing. I'm just never going to be a power lifter. And I'm cool with that. It doesn't really interest me too much anyway. You know, so um, that's the one piece of advice I've learned through. Yeah. So have you used that degree, that biology? Yeah, so I did biology because it interested me. Yeah. And I've obviously, the great thing about biology is it covers chemistry, physics, maths, biology, um, essays, structuring. Um, obviously, you have to do lab work. So that's, uh, you know, like theorizing, uh, coming up with uh, an idea and seeing whether there's a solution to it, you know, proving or disproving things. So in terms of an overall benefit to me, it's been great because it, it's, uh, it's a well-rounded degree. Uh, and obviously with nutrition and having the biology background, I can, I understand that stuff real easy like just pick it up i can understand the the, the mechanisms that are talking about and why it works to me biology makes sense like you, you put this in or this does that and there's a there's a, a result from it whereas like stuff like maths physics it's like equations create an answer and i'm like but where's the equation like it doesn't make sense to me because i can't see the the link between the equation and the answer it's just like you run it through this and it gives you that yeah but why why where did this equation come from and they can't they, to explain that it's like they can't really explain that to you. Some dude came up with it because of a theory of something else and to explain it to you, you can understand it even less because it's not a physical thing. Whereas at least a lot of biology is a physical thing where you can attribute a, an outcome to a, um, an action, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So I'm quite good on that level of, of things. Uh, and so it's helped me in that respect a lot and understanding the body and the mechanics of the body as well. Yeah. And then I've done two degrees actually. So I went back to uni a few years ago um, because I had a year's worth in the UK, you get like up to four years funding if you qualify for it, obviously. And I'd qualified for four years, but I only used three because my degree was three years. And I managed to convince a uh, university in Manchester, Salford University, to let me do, I, I, let me skip the first, skip an entire year because your first year at uni doesn't count in England. Like your marks don't go towards your degree, they're just there to decide whether you can hack uni. Yeah, so you've got to, yeah, if you don't make the average after the first year, they kick you out and you don't mess up their bell curve for their results that's basically what they do so your second year onwards counts yeah. so i persuaded the university that i didn't need the first year because i'd already got a degree and proved i could complete a degree and they're like yeah cool and then i persuaded them to let me do extra modules every term to get two years worth of credits in a year yeah. and so Actually, I, that was the workload then yeah i did that yeah i killed it though like yeah i got first in that degree yeah. and the one where i did it properly i, I didn't get a first <laughs> yeah, I made a lot of friends and had a lot of fun. Man, didn't yeah, I? right. So is that an, a, an extended biology degree or is that a different no, one? No, it's a whole new degree. So that was biology with a focus on human physiology. So in that one, I did a lot less, like zero plants and it was all animals uh, and obviously biological systems and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was a cool one. So you did a lot on like the human anatomy, which was way more useful to me. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I'd really love to dive in because... Was it around this time that Gymshark came along or was this a few years later? The fighting was uh, going on for, I did that for like three or four years, like still working, doing other stuff. Um, but I had a final fight, which was uh, for a, like a, a, a local, well, a Northern belt. Like, so it was like a title fight and um, the referee messed my fight up. So uh, the, I nearly knocked this guy out in the first round. He was a really strong wrestler, but he didn't like being hit too much. And I managed to catch him with a real, you know, when you hit someone with something and you yourself go, Ooh, like, yeah, yeah. it was, it was one of the, yeah. Well, well, yeah. well I, drilled, I got, I drilled him with a, a tie clinch and a knee to the chin, like came, cause he kind of ducked as I clinched and I brought my knee up and I felt it go right through his head, but he had a big ass head. So he didn't go out. He didn't go down. He went real wobbly and, learn this kids when someone goes wobbly don't all of a sudden think about every van damme bruce lee or stallone movie you've ever seen because what will happen next is in your head you'll go flying head kick and what actually happens is is the wrestler grabs your legs and takes you to the ground <laughs> yeah and what our problem was is we were in a really small cage which was common in these like um different federations. Some of the cages were really small. Um, so I ended up being up against the cage real fast because it was only like three feet behind me and it should have been like six. So he managed to go into wrestler mode, even though he was kind of out on his feet and he got me down to the floor. 
Uh, and my game at that time was just defend against any submission, stalemate it. Because if you stalemated it long enough, they used to stand you up. And I was like, cool, let's just get this stood back up because I got this like I'm going to not do my Van Damme. I'll go back to, yeah, we'll, we'll finish him properly. And uh, so he went for like a Kimura um, or Americana, I can't remember which, uh, which it was now. But either way, he basically had, my, he had me in an arm lock and I neutralized it by arm down under my body. He wasn't getting it anywhere and he's ragging away at it, trying to get it up. And he's, his corner's going, break his bloody arm. And I'm saying to his corner, it ain't going to break my arm. <laughs> like, I'm just chilling there. And then the referee then stands us up. And in the, there's a video of it somewhere and I actually stand up and turn around and get ready to fight again and the rest waving it off. And then I'm like, what the fuck? And um, I mean, what the frick? I don't know if you like to say we're out on this. Yes. yes. Bugger can't piss. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, he waved it off and he said my arm was in a dangerous position for too long, which is just like the most nonsense you've ever... If, unless, you, unless you hear a snap or a tap, you don't stop the fight. That is the rules. Um, so then a lot of hecticness ensued where I went after the referee, my, everyone went after everyone and crowd all went, Wah! cause we had a lot of local people there, you know, and everyone was supportive. We had a lot of fighters on the card. So then the crowd started fighting the crowd, the referee, I went after the referee in the KI is fun. Um, but basically what happened was like eight to nine weeks of my life got taken like that in an instant by this idiot ref not knowing his job um so i got so mad at the situation that at the time i've been i got offered to do some fitness work for magazines in uh, london which was just something i'd randomly applied for uh, in like a, a model search or something that uh, my girlfriend at the time had said i oh, put some pictures in for this and they actually rang me back and it was weird like didn't expect it at all so I ended up doing a bit of work down in London for like men's health magazines. I actually, I'm in like a, a sugar babes music video. I'm in like some underwear commercial thing somewhere in the world. I don't know. Yeah. I did some weird stuff. We'll link those in the yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. They're in a whole different paid section of the website. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I did, uh, I was doing that and then, because I'd stopped doing the fighting, I still needed a reason to train because I, I, I need to be goal orientated. Otherwise, I kind of just meander. So I gave myself the um, the, the challenge of doing like a, a natural bodybuilding competition at the time called the BNBF. It was um, so, and I was watching Matt Ogus a lot on YouTube at the time. He was watching him and Chris Lovado, who are good friends of mine now. Um, they were other, they're the OG Gymshark boys, you know, they were like the big YouTubers at the time yeah. that they were brought over and kind of started a whole movement. Um, so I was watching them and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to vlog my journey to the stage. And at the time, like you couldn't make money from YouTube. Like nobody was doing that stuff. Everyone was just putting information up to help other people. Like that was it. That was the only reason we were doing it. So it was a go the reason they call it the golden era is because there was no monetary incentive. Like we were just there to fucking help. Like, just put stuff out there yeah like blow a lot of myths out the water about getting in shape which madly enough still hasn't happened like so many people still think the same things after so many years it's mad but yeah it's yeah fitness is not difficult don't don't make it difficult like it's it's science in versus out it's basics and then you can get a little deeper from there but that is all it comes down to and um so i was vlogging um and I, I was a week out from the show and there's a video where I'm a week out from the show. I'm eating uh, porridge in my back garden with like chocolate protein powder in it, bananas. And then I have a barbecue later on with sausage, white bread, ketchup, which like the whole body world freaks out about if you're anywhere. And I'm like, and I'm like five days from stage shredded to the bone. Like I'm talking and my pecs are bouncing around just on their own because they're so lean that any movement, like the muscle fibers are going everywhere. So it looks kind of mad. And I'm in the sunshine as well. So I'm like veins everywhere because there's no fat on me. And um, the boys at Gymshark at the time were two guys uh, who were just printing their own vests. Like they got their own t-shirt pre uh, print press thing and they were printing them out and they just uh, messaged me at the time saying, listen, we're starting this brand Gymshark and uh, would, you, we're gonna send, would you mind if we send you out some stuff, try it out, let us know what you think um, and send us feedback. I was like, yeah, it's cool. Because at the time, my only theory for putting up content was, 
I might get some like protein from someone or something. It, you know, that'd be cool if that happens kind of thing. And um, it turned out, you know, that the boys, we, we kind of developed a relationship. They drove up from Birmingham up north to where I was to come and see me. We went out for food and we just literally for three years, then I worked with them just on a handshake and just stuck with it, did the whole thing, the expo was the whole lot, you know, and we were all just in it that like, we didn't get paid. Like we got clothes and we got like our travel paid for t- for the hotels. Like, but we gave our own time up. We took time off work and we went and did these things just for this, just to go and meet people and, and do these events. What year was that? Two, uh, it's like seven years ago, isn't it now? So whatever that is, like 2013, 212, something like that, is it? What was their, what was their plan with that uh, at the beginning with, so, with sending you guys out? Do you remember the Z's era? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So they came through off off the back of that. So it was the aesthetics movement. So prior to that, there were no stringers in gyms. Like everyone wore cut like tanks, cut off t-shirt sleeves at the most. Like all those Calvin Klein vests. Remember those Calvin Klein vests, the white wife beater vest? But it was real high. Like there was no stringer things. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? There were these high um that's what people that or t-shirts or hoodies even like everyone was in a hoodie all the time um so they brought through stringers that then these all these racer backs and everything like that um which was not that common and then also when we went to the expos at the time when we first started doing that expo um it was all big bodybuilders that was all there were at these things and they were covered up in a hoodie usually hoods up as well and they all look real moody and they would be across a desk from you and you would literally lean across, do the classic about to arm wrestle pose, yeah. thumbs up and get a photo with them and then move on. That was an expo. We went with the, to the Gymshark, basically put everything they had into that body power expo that we that is now like infamous for, you know, the, we got all, the, all those pictures that you see from the... Uh, I can swear, I can't, yeah, the fuckboy era that, you know, it was what we were, you know what I mean? We were like these chiseled guys with good haircuts that were happy and there was all this like uh, dance music that we played with all our training and all this kind of stuff. And so we turned up to this expo. So we, we were there like an hour where our tops were off. We were hugging people when they came and said hello. Nobody said anything like it. We were playing music on the stand as well. Also not a common thing at the time. Now you go to an expo Everyone's got their tops off. Everyone's blasting music. Everyone's trying to be like hands on and high fiving and being happy and all that stuff. But we, you know, we essentially started all that stuff, which is cool. Like we started an entire more uh, tactile movement towards people meeting people. So it became much less of this uh, kind of an enigma behind a desk and, and more to a person who you could shake the hand and connect to, which was way better. And created that whole probably a good five year, four or five year run of really fun time. So, and that person that you know people are coming to see you guys, and you guys changed the game by actually giving them the time of day. Where yeah, we before it was just photos and out. Dude, we we I once so when I first went to that Expo, I wasn't that well known, like online at that time. I had like maybe like ten thousand followers on Instagram or something like that. So like a lot of the English guy, some of the English people would recognize me and stuff like that, but not much. And then in the next year, I grew quite a lot from being because I went to stay with like Matt Ogres and stuff like that. And obviously the Jim Sharp movement got bigger, so we, you know that, that helped along the way as they brought more people in from around the world. So we all got a bit more exposure. Um, but one year, the second year, I think it was the second or third year we went there. All of a sudden, I had a queue like that would, did not end. And it kept recycling. It just went and I didn't move from one spot for eight hours. That's how dedicated we were to meeting every person that came to that line. Like I literally didn't pee, didn't eat. did Like I literally at the time had, um, Lainey at the time was walking up behind me and would just shove something into my face to make me eat. Cause she was like, you just, you can't keep going. And literally I stood for eight hours and didn't move. It was, that yeah, was cool. But that was the first, I wasn't expecting it. That was the thing. So I was so overwhelmed by the support that I was like, I cannot miss anyone. Like I, I felt so indebted and uh, like, I don't know. It was just, it was such an epic feeling to know and all these people come in telling you they're not just coming to say hello as well they're telling you a story of something you've done that, that's helped them and you're like really that dumb thing i said that i think all the time help you that's awesome which is why i say is one of my things is and and listen to this now ignore all the big huge spiels you hear that dumb thing you are thinking say it out loud i guarantee in the same room you're sitting right now 50 percent of the other people in that room are thinking the exact same thing you are not alone in thinking that one stupid thing about yourself 
yeah, you are not abnormal for it. I guarantee so many other people think the exact same thing all the time. Yeah, yeah that, absolutely. Did, um, I don't want to go back too far, but after the MMA moving into the bodybuilding scene, um, did you have a dark time there? Like you seem like a pretty strong, strong minded guy. Um, but I know that would have sort of knocked you down a little bit, that rest well, call. Oh no, like that, 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 I literally walked away from fighting. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah, yeah. before, I guess, sort of the mindset like, flip when Gymshark approached you, like, was there a space there that you were... I don't... I'm very... I'm good at not being sad for more than three days. Like, I don't know why that is, but I'm like, break up, breakups, injury, losing money, whatever. Three days. So I'll give myself. After that, I'm just being a bitch. It's like, what, what, what are you now achieving by being miserable about this thing? Like, literally, what, what is it achieving? Nothing. If anything, it's making you worse. Like, more bad things are going to come if you keep being this miserable sod. So, um, yeah, the fighting thing, I didn't just walk away from it and do nothing. I walked away from it and took an opportunity given to me by the, by the magazine work. But I, was, I couldn't do the magazine work if I was fighting. That was the trade-off. Because you couldn't be booked for a, a, a shoot or something and turn up with, like, a black eye. So at the time, I was having to make a decision which way I wanted to go. So it's, so if you think eight weeks of my life, so I, I was, dude, I was so fit for that fight. Like I was fighting 18 stone guys in my gym. Like, so I was, I, I was tough. I was uh, able to, I was able to fight five, five minute rounds with a fresh guy every minute. Like, you know, on Grinder that'd be a great profile. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so <laughs> but I, I was super fit. So if you imagine that just rug being ripped out from under you, because I was like professional fight level fit cardio wise, not the skill set wise, like I'm this. And this is where I'm leading to this with that at the time was the worst thing in the world. Like it, it devastated me. But if that had not happened, I would have gone on to be an OK, like local fighter, you know, probably you know, still working two jobs, uh, the money making from the fights only covering the training that you're doing and would not have had any of the opportunities I've had now. And whenever I look back at any bad thing that's happened to me, I've deemed as being bad. It is now actually one of the best things that could have ever happened to me because it made, forced me into another direction that gave me an opportunity that led me even further in life. So sometimes like, yeah, you have to fail at something to be successful at the thing you're supposed to be successful at. Like it's just not the universe will look after you if you let it. But if you let something devastate you to the point where you then close your eyes to other opportunities around you, that's when bad leads to bad. But if you keep your eyes open and keep your focus and just put your energy elsewhere straight away, other opportunities will present themselves. I guarantee it. Like I'll put all the money in my bank on it. It really will. Like you just, it, the reason it doesn't is if you close your eyes and shut yourself off to it. Yeah. So, yeah. So no darkness, short term, long term, best thing that could happen to me. No, that's, uh, that's brilliant, man. And you see, you see it across the board with, with people who are highly successful, the ones you do know about and the ones you don't. It's like Dwayne Johnson, footy career over, Pff, look where it lead it. It's like, and the list goes on. Um, so up until what we got up to earlier with Gymshark, you were, were you still working two jobs and then in between that? Uh, yeah, I was. What was I doing at the time? So I moved, I moved towns as well, even after the fight thing. So like, yeah, if, if one thing goes wrong, I tend to throw myself in a complete other direction of just like, let's chase this other thing then. So um, I left the town I was living there and I moved to the city, to Manchester, living in an apartment. Um, with my sister because we were lucky like my mum had invested in a property there so my sister and I lived in that apartment to uh for a good few years um and I what was I doing there so I went back studying for a little bit but then I was working as an estate agent oh no at first I worked in property acquisitions but then the market crashed and then I went into estate agency because I started to pay bills um and then went back to studying and then yeah uh, ended up getting doing the YouTube thing. Uh, what did I do then? I mean, because for a long time, I st YouTube, like, doesn't... A lot of people get a bit of misconception on this. YouTube doesn't really pay you much at all. Like, um, the money that you make from being on social media is when you work with brands. So they're paying for your exclusivity of featuring on your content. That's where the money's made. So YouTube itself, 
makes a lot of money. It doesn't pay people a lot of money. Um, so even though I was getting better on YouTube, if I wasn't getting paid outside of anywhere from anywhere else, I wasn't really making any money from YouTube. So I was still working. And you know, I was I would have still been doing other things up until I was still PTing. So I started my own online um, kind of nutritional, uh, doing nutritional plans and training plans online. So that that uh, slowly built over time. So uh, that was good. Um, and I think that kind of facilitated me being able to start some of the stuff I did own. I'll tell you what I did do. I owned a bakery for a while. Yeah, yeah, dude. yeah. No, it gets better. It gets better. Let, let, let's let's dial it down, Lex. What did you really own? It was a cupcake bakery. Oh. <laughs> not kidding. Not even joking. So it was like a coffee shop that you come in, and there was all these like. Um, it was uh, my partner at the time. She was big into a baking, and she like was baking all every week, all week doing stuff. And she was teaching at the time, and she didn't really like the job because we she it was in a rough area in Manchester, and it was you know she did a lot of work for very little reward. And um, she want, at one point someone suggested that these things that she made could be sold. And then it was like, well, would you like to do that? And she's like, well, yeah, because I guess so. I said, well, let's, let's just do it. Let's just go sign a lease on our thing. And then we moved towns again to where we opened up a bakery. This cupcake, it was, called, it was a, a, a coffee shop that we sold, basically bespoke cupcakes. But we also did wedding cakes and birthday cakes. And I, it turned out that like I can apparently make cool shit out of sugar paste <laughs> yeah yeah and i ended up making all this artwork for so i've always been quite artistic like i did art at school and stuff like that so i can draw relative uh, you know relatively well and um paint to an extent um it turns out i can sculpt stuff out of uh, edible sugar paste you were designing so yeah cake. basically well what happened was she was making all these like extravagant looking cakes with the piping and everything and and then someone once came in and said can you put a dog on top of the cake and i said yes because we needed the money to make the order and then i went and learned how the freak you make a dog uh yeah and then slowly by the end of it i could make you out of sugar paste like i'd literally get a photo of you and i can mold your face using little tools and stuff how good yeah the focus yeah i did like a full yeah. motorbike and everything yeah the hyper focus thing Four yeah, hours I would literally later. literally spend 12 hours making a model for a cake no problem yeah yeah i did it so long once that i was bent over on the uh, desk like i was i was creating small pieces of uh, uh, small paintings so they had a frame and everything on them but i was painting paintings inside the frames yeah and i did it for so long that then i tried to stand up and trap my own sciatica nerve and and collapsed on the floor because i had been in the same position for so i've been in the same position for uh, six hours just doing these things. And then I tried to stand up straight too quickly and because my muscles were all seized over, my legs gave way. And I mean, this is me in the bakery at like 2, 3 a.m. on my own, on the floor, like <laughs> just, just lying there, waiting slowly for like my legs to come back through. Yeah, it was it was not good. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that, that's and again, this is where this hyper focus thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that was going to be my question. Is is you said before you love you, you'll go all in on stuff you love, and obviously yeah. being creative, that was that was well, an a outlet. big shout out to my mum for that one as well. My mum has never been someone to say that won't work. If I came up with an idea, she'd be like, "That sounds good." Yeah, yeah, that sounds yeah. You can do that. She was always like she never gave the, any sign of doubt. It was like, you want to do that? Okay. Yeah. And because it, it never gave you fear. And my mom also never, ever let on when we had very little money growing up. Like if she was in trouble with money, we, I never knew as a kid, like never, she never let on. So there was never, I never had that fear factor of like excessive bills, red letters coming through the door and all that. She went through that on her own to make sure that I didn't have that kind of, uh, that. that's like a uh, fear. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, brilliant. so um, with uh, when did the bakery, when, when did you s decide to stop? Yeah, yeah, what happened was the YouTube game obviously started to take off quite a lot. And then travel became more of a factor. It was starting to like they were starting to process, listen, we're going to be doing this and this and this. Yeah. Seeing so me traveling quite a lot. Uh, uh, I also like I split up with the, my partner at the time who we had the bakery with. Um, so I went and went more i went full-time doing the gym shark on youtube and so i left her with the, the bakery she's still going now i think she's uh with a, uh merged with another person so she's still going so that's nice. all cool yeah that you were running a bakery and working with a fitness brand at the, Dude, time. the funniest thing <laughs> was so yeah but imagine imagine walking into a cake shop and seeing me i was serving yeah. i made the coffee so i loved making the coffee yeah. so you'd see you come in and see me behind this like <laughs> counter and people would literally walk in and be like double taking yeah. like 
why are you not like a, a, a chunky red rosy little woman like why, why is this no beard as well so Still. i didn't know no beard stubble though stubble yeah. and aggressive hairstyling so i'd have the cr- short cropped side kind of um even like you know when, they, when there was that phase where we had a, a step and they didn't fade it yeah they're that all oh, that kind of That's aggressive very pommy, isn't it? yeah very uk yeah yeah it's quite a uk thing that i think yeah so yeah, I was quite, I was still on point, but not, no, no, the beard wasn't in yet. Yeah. I don't think the beard came in until, when did the beard come in? Way later on. Well, Way later on. Later. Yeah. Yeah. So, so from here, YouTube's obviously going well. Um, you progress through, things go on. We saw a post, I saw a post the other day and it really stood out to me. It was a shot, you're on your bike yeah. and there's a swipe right. You're on a bike again. Completely look like completely different people. Oh yeah, the the me on my drive and me now not giving a shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah the me thinking I should conform versus me yeah, being yeah. me. Yeah. What was what was it was brilliant. What was it like during that time of before and and trying to be something that you yeah, weren't? Yeah. So that came about. It was only for a year. Um, and it was when YouTube changed all their algorithm and they changed the way that their system worked. So they were no longer notifying your subscribers that you're uploading. So like I, I could upload something to half a million people and they don't know because they're no longer telling them that you're who you're subscribed to is just put a new video, up, which is the most insane thing I can think of. It's, re- but what people need to know about YouTube is, um, they don't, they don't, I'm a f- screw you, YouTube. You don't care about your creators. Like. I went and spent a full day in YouTube when because I noticed um, instantly I put a post up one day, a video up, and it did not do what it should have done. Like instantly I knew something was wrong and it was because of this change. So I went overnight from getting 60 to 80,000 views on a video to struggling to hit 20 for no reason other than they changed their what, what they wanted people to see on their system. And I went down to YouTube to break this down, spent an entire day, traveled to London, spent my money to go there to talk to them, sat with the the head of the UK, who was in charge of the UK YouTube side of things. They went went through everything with them um, and then they did zero, zero to help me at all. Made out like they were gonna do something and then zero. Would refuse, refuse to tell me like, why this had happened to my channel, why they were, why there wasn't any support for it, why what I'd been asking to be done, to researched, to be, I, I wanted to see like how my channel was being viewed, what's being analyzed on it. I wanted all these information to see what was happening. Nothing, nothing. So basically as they were, well, they, they, they were supposed to be help for it, but then whoever I spoke to on the day face to face who empathized with me and was, you know, went through the process of helping me and gave me a lot of cool stuff to try to like feed the algorithm and all that jazz. Once they handed that off to someone else to look at the back end just to see, because at the time people were being unsubscribed to my channel involuntarily. People who were signed up for notifications weren't being notified. And I was getting messages from my subscribers telling me this. And I was showing them screenshots of this. And they were adamantly saying, no, that's not happening. I was like, here is message. I still get it today. Had it just the other week, someone messaging me going, dude, I've been unsubscribed to your channel. Thought you'd stopped uploading. It was like 80 videos ago, (laughs) you know? So there's a, there's a lot going on there, but obviously once I'd spoken to this person face to face, they obviously pushed it up to the next level where it's supposed to go. That person's never met me. doesn't care. I'm just another number. So that whole day was wasted really because whoever they handed it off to didn't, no, no care. So I just, you know, once you realize that that wasn't happening, um, I then started, um, trying to work to the algorithm rather than doing what I wanted to do. I tried to feed the algorithm what I thought it wanted. I tried to be a look that I thought would be more successful in a commercial aspect. And hence, you know, that I lost part of my identity to that, um, which is a, a, a danger of social media. You know what I mean? Like a, you're, you're a slave to their system that you really don't have control. You only have control of what you want to do, but outside of, getting people to see your stuff, which I know is a lot of work for people now wanting to, a lot of people want to be social media influencers as a job. Like you have to realize we, when we started, we did not want that. That was not our goal. Like I said, when we came in, we put information out to help people. 
because we found it cool that we were finding these things out and we thought more people should know about it. And we actually were putting things out for free so that people weren't getting ripped off by the likes of Mike Chang and people like that at the time who was selling, like they were doing these awful adverts for the red drink, a magic red drink that would help you burn fat and all these things. When You know, which it was basically a pre-workout. That's all it was. Yeah. But if you're an average person, he was. these people were paying thousands every month to have their products advertised on YouTube to people to be promoted posts before other people were really doing that kind of thing. So people would see this thing everywhere. And that dude made millions from people's naivety. And we were like, fuck that guy. Like, well, you see it slowly seeing less and less of it because people are getting smarter, yeah. thankfully. And other influencers are now speaking out against the bullshit, which is cool to see. Like, um, you know, they're literally breaking things down to the science and going, no, that's shit. And here's the proof of why. So, um, hopefully we're starting to, I mean, it's a tough trend to break because you're talking about what we live in a bubble. So, you know, fitness, you know, fitness, I know it, Nathan knows it, but we forget that we are all of a similar mind. Hence, that's why we're hanging out. Yeah. When you, have you ever done the thing where you go somewhere that you don't normally go like a spa or something and you go, Oh, this is real people. This is people who don't do what we do. And it's bizarre, but you forget, and we, and that's our, that is um, a failing on our behalf actually as well, because we become kind of blinkered to the, what's outside of what we know, and so I think we need to remember that the normal person doesn't even know what a carb is, like or a fat or a protein. They don't know. They just know it's some kind of food, you know. You can't blame them to a sense when they see advertisements like that, like you know. You can't blame them at all. There's no education. When at school, do, do they talk about proteins, carbs, and fats? And they should be but they're not. And it should be part of a freaking career. There should be a full class once a week dedicated to nutritional advice or teaching for kids. This is a real stuff in general, how to make money after school, like like personal development, like all these things, it's it's my biggest argument yeah. against That's school as well. That's a bigger kettle of fish though, how to make money after school. Sure, there. sure. But, but to it's... teach a kid like this, like fat, and why sugar can be bad in big doses compared to, you know, why fat isn't terrible but needs to be monitored, you know, to give them simple, you know, uh, a simple awareness of what, what energies in food in terms of calories and stuff, not, not to make them scared of food or anything, but to educate them on just what's what simple breakdowns. Yeah. That's so easy to implement. Like we could be doing that, no problem. And teachers could be taught the simple basics yeah. to then a PE teacher, I'm pretty sure will be able to hold an hour class a week to yeah. teach kids about stuff like this. Yeah. Like teach that kid that loves chocolate why it's bad to eat chocolate and it's not a punishment that you're not allowed to have as much as you want. It's because it's not good for you and this is why, yeah. you know. Uh, it's hard It's hard when the internet's so saturated, full of such a huge yeah, vast it is a variety of information. For, especially for someone who's not educated in it. You type in, you know, uh, uh, what's a good diet? Jesus, good luck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good luck getting through those advertisements. Yeah. And now, now we've got all the keto zealots and the freaking carnivore. Yeah, and this yeah, is just, yeah. Can I just say now, if you're doing keto or you're doing carnivore, or you're doing any of these crazy ass diets, it's just an elimination diet. That's the only reason you feel better. That is it. And if you're doing intermittent fasting, it's not magic. It's because all of a sudden you are consistent in your eating and you're consistent when you stop eating. So you wake up looking similar and you are actually thinking about when to eat because you've only got a certain time, so you're just more consistent. You are doing the work, not the magic intermittent fasting. <sighs> I like it, I do. So, that, come back to that photo, when did you, so how did you sort of find yourself in that, that change of style yeah. that you started outputting? So it was a similar mentality to when I first stepped on stage doing the bodybuilding. Like, it's no, like everyone's like, how do you step on stage? Basically wearing a, what can only be described as a, a budgie like what what do they call them a, a, a budgie hammock or whatever the frick they call them banana hammock that's it yeah Bana budgie smugglers banana hammock there we go not a budgie hammock <laughs> although a budgie hammock is a niche item that could do well i mean who knows budgies might like hammocks they do they, you know <laughs> uh yeah so my mentality getting on stage was fuck it they don't know me and I'll probably never see any of these people again. And it was a very similar thing, similar mentality to, it was a fuck it mentality. And that's what I'll call it. It was, I just said, you know what? Fuck it. And I'm going to go back to doing what I, well, I actually sat down with myself and went, why did you get hired to do what you do now? Because you were being you doing your shit. Yeah. 
you didn't get hired because you were playing a character or um, created a scenario that they liked. No, you were just doing stuff you wanted to do. That got you to where you are. Why did you stop? And then I was like, my brain went, well, I after my brain told me that, I went, yeah, you're right. I'm going to go back to that. Yeah. Because <laughs> sometimes like, I swear my brain and me are separate things. Like Sometimes when I walk, the key thing, like when I walk into a room, go, where are my keys? At the back of my mind, I hear this. <laughs> yeah, he knows exactly where they are. He knows that I came in, looked at a banana on my right and thought, I'm hungry. And it put my keys down with my left hand and went, you'll never find them. <laughs> yeah. I, love that, it. I was going to ask about your confidence because you, you, um, you are a very confident guy and you output that very well, definitely not in a cocky way. Um, but is it that same mentality of just like, you, you're not caring about what people are perceiving you to be? Yeah, you can't too much to an extent like you should care if you know if you're putting kittens in bins and setting the bins on fire care what people think about you but if you're just trying to help others fuck what that other guy says who's trying to bring you down like if you're doing something positive there will only be here's the thing it's real easy to try and drag someone down rather than pull yourself up real easy it's the the lazy man's method of not having to improve themselves is trying to drag everyone else down to their level um and it's a real easy thing to get rid of as well if you've got friends who, here's one, you know, when you say, you know, Dave, yeah, he's all right some of the time, isn't he? Right? So for the, some of the time he's not all right, he's a dick. Yeah, pretty much. So why are you even hanging around with him then? Like, why is he even in your life? Get rid of Dave. Like, lose him from your life. He's a, like, if somebody doesn't bring positive to your world, cut them out. Just, and I've done it with family. Like, it doesn't matter if, like and don't get me wrong now families come back because they were like oh was stupid and you're like yeah he was stupid you know <laughs> and you let them back in and you can do the same with the friend but if they bring a negative to your world or they're a drain on you or all they do is come to you with their problems all the time and unload on you cut them out don't do not be afraid to be alone you won't be alone for long if you're a decent human being because by cutting out those people that are a drain on your life you get to spend more of your time finding people you like and then you surround yourself with more people of the same mentality who will help raise you higher. And as a collective, you end up being in a more positive environment. And then you see what you see online with people when they get together. You know, a lot of the time it elevates. Everyone's elevating everyone. And you're seeing that much more and more now, um, especially in the podcast era. It's like you've got people bouncing between each other's podcasts you know to help each other they're advertising each other's on each other's things and because they're over then because it's a conversational piece they tend to be people with similar mentalities because they can converse you know so they're able to bounce off each other and so it's the same in any situation surround yourself with like-minded people and you'll always do better yeah. just don't i just don't understand what's the point like i would rather have two good friends than 20 acquaintances yeah that just makes more sense and plus like who has the energy to, 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 I don't have excess energy to waste on some person that just moans all the time. Yeah. Christ. Yeah, it's draining. It's it incredibly draining. It's really draining. And it leaves you in a bad mood afterwards. Because yeah. it's just like the downers of the world. Yeah. Don't be around them. Just leave them. I love it. I love it. Man, what is, what's next for you? What do you, what do you see moving forward? Uh, so at the moment, what am I doing now? So I started going back away not away from bodybuilding um I, I love bodybuilding as a an art form like i don't do i want to compete the only reason i want to compete is not for me it would be to show the journey for others i i'm can take or leave it and i don't i wouldn't care about winning or losing because it's so subjective like it's not like fighting where i punch you better than you punch me i win you know it's someone's opinion so the and if you're going to do a bodybuilding show it's the journey that matters did you get better as you went did you learn did you improve yes then you've won then you've won you know you don't need a five dollar trophy to be a success in that field no you know the, the journey is what matters in that and it will teach you a lot and it is a boundary breaker mentally um just do it with macros not chicken and broccoli <laughs> I was gonna say, if you yeah, do it, I'm yeah. expecting a vlog with a barbecue oh, in the background. Yeah, before, yeah. Well. and I think uh, a lot of people 
um, it, it was, I did say I wanted to do a number of things. I wanted to, I wanted to have a boxing match. I wanted to compete again and I wanted to do adventure more and do challenges. And that was, I had a boxing match set up, uh, for a white collar boxing match for charity, which I was going to do. And it then turned out, I just sods law. It was on the same weekend as a Gymshark massive Birmingham pop-up store. Uh, so I had to, uh, I luckily hadn't announced I was going to do it. So, and I found out far enough in advance that, so I had, didn't have that match. And then in between that happening, I got this tendonitis in my shoulder, which stopped me being able to throw a punch. Yeah. So unfortunately, like that just side sidelined it and derailed that idea for the time frame I wanted it in. Um, and I, so I said I wanted to compete, but what I wanted to do was the whole, I wanted to do a boxing match, get in shape for the boxing match and then compete afterwards to show that you could do these two very like, um, yeah, very opposite kind of directional things, but still end up with the same, attainable physique kind of thing like you can be an athlete and step on a stage you don't have to be one or the other um so that was the idea so i still wanted i do still want to facilitate that i just have to rehab this fucking shoulder first you know um and it's frustrating i was saying to, to nathan the other day that having like a, um an impingement or something in your shoulder is like it's like the groin pull of your sh of the upper body it's so annoying. Like it's a fuck boy injury in my opinion. Like there's no bruising, there's no blood. My arm still moves in certain directions, but then I try and go and do one thing, like throw a jab or a hook and it just goes boom. Like literally you're wincing pain. So it's super annoying, but I've just got to, I just got that time. Just like heal, do the rehab. Yeah. Seems like you go with the flow very much, especially moving forward. Yeah. Um, not thinking too far ahead. It's just like, what's the next thing? Yeah. It, it set, you set your goals yeah. and flow. Yeah, got to. I mean, if you get too focused on one thing and then you just like fail at that one thing and then your whole world crumbles, that's yeah, a bad thing. But if you just set yourself, I'll tell you what is good, realistic timelines um, rather than, because you always get these people in eight weeks, I'm going to do this. That's not a long time, dude. In your head, it sounds long. That ain't long. Yeah. Like if I, when I dieted for shows, 25 weeks yeah. I took to do it. Real slow, real steady, loads of error room, loads of plateau point breakers, you know. So, whereas you get people who do 12, 10, 12 weeks and they're panicking at week seven because they're not where they need to be. And then they get mad and stuff starts to fall off and derail. So, in anything you do, set yourself like a realistic timeline and that will always help because yeah. there's less pressure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you think Do you think far, far ahead in the future? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, alongside the short terms, I've started doing, I've started, the bodybuilding is the art. So, yeah, I want to kind of, I think I'll, I'd like to have a go at a physique show because I think they're more, um, current. I think there's more people who want to do that than they want to put on budgie smugglers and jump on a stage covered in Ron Seal wood stain, you know? Um, so if I do do one, it would be, you know, a physique show just to see, and it'd be more about getting super lean rather than the mass monster kind of thing, which obviously isn't attainable unless you go to the dark side. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it'd be a physique. Uh, a physique show and then i do want to have the boxing match for charity because i want to raise i want to raise some money for something good you know i want to do some uh some good in the world and obviously i'm on a platform where i can do that and obviously help people hopefully have some people come along i want to do like a spartan race or something as well yeah that's cool yeah i was in talk talks with them to be able to do something where we have like our own area and some cool things and get gym shark involved and maybe doing some like unique t-shirts for the day where people come and they get you know like a gift bag for joining in with alongside me and they can help drag me along because there'll be there'll be some dudes there who wipe the floor with me you know who could probably come along who yeah. fell runners people like that you know, savages just yeah. absolute savages so that'd be fun you know to do something like that i just anything that brings the community together i kind of want to do that kind of thing and then um the adventure side of things i'm doing like i've started doing that like i've done the mountain climb with the marine already you know i've, I've been uh, touring on the motorbike all the way through europe um i want to do a skydive um i get more tattoos i'm getting you know i'm starting to get more inked up just doing cool stuff yeah i'm going legs next yeah lower leg i want to get that done um so i'm just kind of living life and, and doing some crazy stuff like like coming out to see nathan wasn't a, a big um planned thing it was like do you want to come out you can come now how long for cool flights booked you know it was that kind of thing so i want to do a lot more of that and then hopefully nathan will be coming over to england and we'll do some cool stuff like take him and do some english things like shooting pigeon clay pigeon shooting and uh loads, loads of cool things around us that i want to do so it's like bouncing back and forth getting people over going and seeing people um traveling more as well like for the experience rather than for work which is kind of what this is as well so nathan's kindly like driving me all over the show we're going to byron bay and being places that i haven't seen because i've been to australia for work 
And so I've seen like the Opera House and done bits and bobs of that. I saw Kooji. Kooji, how'd you say it? Kooji? Kooji. I went to Kooji. I spent a thousand pounds on coffee in a week. <laughs> Fucking did as well. Bloody expensive. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, lovely. But yeah, that was fun. Um, but I didn't really see much of Australia. It was just, you know, those nice spots. So my sister lives over here. So she, yeah, she, she lives in, um, she was living in Kooji. Now she's in Melbourne, but she has a business in both. Yeah. So yeah, my family's all a little crazy actually. When I look through it, we were having a chat the other day again with Nathan again, and it popped into my head that none of us do anything really normal. So my sister does like, um, she's called uh, Shusha Beauty over here. She does microblading, the tattoo work for like eyebrows, um, um, eyes, lips, and all that kind of stuff to a really high level. Like she does individual hairlines in the eyes, so it's kind of like you can't tell that it's not real hair on their face. But then she does like cosmetic tattooing as well for kind of. Well, I think she was training to do this or she can do it now. And it's like, you know, if women have had a mastectomy from like breast cancer and she can tattoo the nipple back on, you know, when they have like the implant put in. So that's a kind of a nice thing as well. So she's been really, she's been really, uh, really successful with that setting of a business over here. Um, then my cousin climbs glaciers and goes to crazy ass places for a living with an adventure company filming like snowboarding down mountains and all this. He's literally going to like the, north pole or something soon so yeah it's mad and he he for ages like went and lived in mongolia for just for the sake of it uh, for a while like he for years he like lived on nothing just for experiences just doing things and now he's contracted with this adventure company doing like all these crazy ass things to get these amazing uh video sequences you see online for uh not online uh, in like um documentaries and stuff like that so he's he like camps halfway up a rock face like literally you know when they hang off the rock yeah like belted onto the rock side and stuff he does all that he's mad mad yeah tom if you're listening you're a nutcase um yeah he's so funny he would turn up to my house um where we had spare bedrooms for people to sleep in in a camper van and then would go back out onto the drive to sleep in his camper van where for the night because it just had everything he liked yeah he just that was what he yeah that's what you said it sounds like within your family there's a common theme of you know human connection seems to be a massive part yeah. for you guys and an adventure as well like you you know looking doing, at the job that you get things. to do now. yeah yeah i can tell you a real funny story that tom told me yeah let's ask on a tangent so i hadn't seen tom for a while because he literally lived in mongolia but he used to send these amazing emails to us on little updates and they were like these amazing little stories where he would he, he talked about this one time in mongolia where he was like it was so he's he's he grew up on national trust estates in england which is like protected huge estates you know like the heritage housing yeah so his his uh, my my uncle and aunt were they would care for these estates so they would live in part of the house and then obviously care for events and take care of everything around for for the national trust so he grew up basically in these crazy ass houses where we would drive around on mobility scooter things, which we called our army car as kids. We'd, we'd camo ourselves up and just go out on these. It was our Jeep and we'd have bows and arrows, actual bows and arrows. And we'd go into the woods and just shoot stuff. <laughs> yeah, this is like his world. So he grew up like that, like a bit crazy doing stuff. Um, he does reenactments and stuff now as well, you know, where they just charge at each other wearing like medieval stuff and just whap each other's swords yeah he does that stuff as well so he's dead into his history but he so he went and lived he went out and did he was he helped like cl people climb kilimanjaro and stuff like that. he nearly fell off it one time because he went for a pee in the mist and nearly stepped off the edge <laughs> yeah there's because there's a legit bits where you can fall um yeah he did that that was just like he said that just like yeah i nearly fell off it like what hmm? <laughs> it just makes nothing of yeah the mountain yeah the mountain doing what how uh it's foggy i went for a wee <laughs> uh yeah so he he saw he, he was out in mongolia and he did this whole story about how he would he went and basically haggled with this dude to buy what was essentially a yak turned inside out as a coat so that he could stay warm whilst he was out there. Yeah, he stayed in some mad places. Like his bed was a wooden board with a sheet on it. And he said, you know, he said, I said, what? He said, oh yeah, you got used to it after a while. He said, you know, it was, it was fine for me. He said, not so good if you brought a, a young lady back though. Hard on the knees it was, hard on the knees. <laughs> So he has this real old worldly way of speaking, even though he's a young guy. So he would send these amazing emails and one was of him going skiing. So his email was like, so the, um, the past weekend, I thought it would be a, a, a fun idea to 
venture into the, into the mountains and do a bit of skiing uh, and sample a bit of the Mongolian um, outback you know, areas. And uh, he said, upon uh, arriving at the ski center, center we can call a hut, uh, there was, I was promptly given my skis and boots, which seemed to fit relatively okay, and was then directed towards the safety procedures, which was a sign of a man falling off a mountain with a red line through it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then and then he goes. So upon successfully passing the safety course, we headed up the mountain, <laughs> and the email goes about getting the mountain. And then he goes. So pointing my skis down the hill, I set on my way down back towards the bottom. It was at this point that I realised it was probably a bad idea to be wearing a trilby, <laughs> so, with one hand on my hat and the other trying to mad, uh, crazily steer me in the correct directions. I realised I was gathering some speed. It was at this point I noticed a building at the foot of the mountain. I was heading right towards. <laughs> Having realized I hadn't been told how to adequately, adequately stop at fast pace, I careered headlong into the side of the building with a satisfying thud. <laughs> it was at this point that a woman came out of the building, speaking English strangely enough, and furthermore, I realized it was to be my employer for the week, as this was the English tutorial building that I would be teaching at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and he just used to send these brilliant emails and that was how he was introduced to his new job was him going headlong into the side of the building he would be teaching at after wearing uh, one hand on a hat flying down a mongolian mountain yeah and so you know that's my family kind of thing <laughs> yeah my, mine's relatively normal in comparison i love I it yeah. i love it i want to know because because a common theme has been for you as as Mitch said has been contribution and connection and giving back and yeah. and everything that you do is as long as people are getting something out of you or providing some kind of value yeah. Yeah. what do you want to be remembered by I don't know because I never really had like a, a mantra for I'm not it's not like I'm a humanitarian or anything like that my, one of my sisters is a massive humanitarian she she went out to all the like uh, Syrian refugee camps and everything against our wills. We, she was like determined to try and get murdered, but she didn't. So she's all right. She helped a lot of people instead. So well done for you. Um, actually, a quick shout out to Sophia as well, who's my uh, middle youngest sister. Just started making her own backpacks in Bordeaux. She lives in Bordeaux now. She now makes, hand makes all her own backpacks called Le Pop Up. And they're made from recycled rubber tubing. And they're the coolest looking things. And she's literally just launched that the other week as like a little side thing that she does because she's also like a tutor for English and stuff. Yeah, so another little mad one. She lives in this little apartment, which is now taken up by this industrial sewing machine thing. Yeah. Half of it. Yeah, she's well in. Um, so... I've never really, I just kind of put stuff out there and hope it helps people. And it just seems that if you word things in a certain way and make people feel at ease with not being perfect at everything, you can help someone feel better about themselves, which in turn can, can actually turn their life around. Yeah. In it, and you would be surprised how such little kindness can create big change. And so, you know, if you can be one thing, be fucking kind, reach out to someone like, don't just walk past people yeah. if they're if someone's upset ask them are you okay yeah. like sometimes all it takes is somebody to just give you some form of connection to pull you out of a very dark place so i would like to i, I don't know i don't have any intention of being remembered for anything um like maybe a 90 year old dude flying backwards in a mclaren on fire and in you know if that's the way i go out that'd be pretty cool yeah. um so, but other than that, it's just as long as as long as what I'm doing brings a positive to someone's world and doesn't harm or hurt anyone, I'm cool, yeah. you know. And and if the fact that helps me make money and and I get to live a a life that lets me kind of do what I want and create more of what I do, then all the all the more for it. But in terms of intentions, like I want to do more in terms of making things accessible to people and breaking it down to make it simpler because as much as we know about macros and nutrition and stuff like that some people no matter how much you tell them it just seems daunting too daunting too much work too hard so um i'm working with a number of people to create like an, an app to simplify um eat uh, people to, so it can help people learn how to eat properly so it would be like because the worst thing you can be given is a meal plan because it teaches you nothing eat this, eat this, eat this. You, no one asks why. They just do it and hope it works. You need to, to, to be able to do anything for a long period of time, you need to learn why it works, how to implement it, and how to change it if you need to. 
And a lot of people, especially the American marketplace, worked for a long time on keeping people in the dark. So they would never tell you why you had a diet, why anything changed in the diet. They'd just change it and then say, do it. Because they wanted you to have to come back. I don't want that. I want, I want someone to be provided with something for a very affordable amount of money that they won't miss, that they won't notice, but it will make a big change in their life. So my way of going to be doing that is to trying to create an app that is not only about, so it will have like your goals, you will put in it, your weight and all that kind of jazz. And it will give you meal options, but it'll give you the breakdowns of those meals and the ingredients. So then you learn what's in them. But alongside having that, I want it to have a whole section of, um, what to do if you're waking up and feeling unmotivated? What to do if you're feeling down? What to do if your best friend just suddenly stopped talking to you? Like, I want it to have a whole lifestyle section of what do I do if, you know? And, and then just to make people feel like you're not alone. Yeah. That kind of thing. So that's what I want to do. That's my big plan for kind of this year is to develop that, you know? Um, but it's not easy. Like, it's not easy. It's easy to release like a, uh, you know, a, a simplistic fitness app where you can plug in numbers and it spits out a meal plan for you. Like that, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of people putting those out for a lot of money for nothing. There's a lot of people doing really good app versions of those at the moment. So if you are struggling, have a look around. I know Nathan and Milestone have got a great one going that really breaks down all their training and everything for you and explains why and is adaptive. So that's great. Um, just don't be kept in the dark. Like if you're going to invest in something, invest in something that teaches you and provides you with something that will stay with you. Like if you buy something, it should stay with you. It shouldn't be a temporary thing. Like if you've paid for information, it should be freaking information you can keep. So, um, yeah, I want to, I want to go more along that kind of lifestyle side of things, maybe like life coach esque thing, but with a more encompassing, uh, feel to it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's difficult, man, making those mainframes. If it's not like a, a standard thing, then uh, it's, it's, it's a lot like people ask a lot of money to do it because it's a commodity. So it's, it's trying to find a way of doing that that then allows me to make it and not have to charge people shit, you know? Yeah, so it's, it's going to be a challenge, but we'll see where we get to with it, you know? It might just end up being like a, a life coaching thing or a way of, you know, something, you know, maybe uh, an app that just gives you goals for your days depending on how you're feeling and different things you can be trying morning routines all that kind of jazz something like that i don't know i've got a lot of things spinning around my head yeah. you know and i just try and see and we see where we go with things i usually end up with something at the end yeah i really 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 love that man um before we get into the the, the final question where can people find you if they haven't already oh yeah just type in uh, Lex Fitness on Grinder, and uh, <laughs> I don't know why I keep making Grinder jokes so much. It's been our thing. It's been our thing this whole week. That's why I don't know. Mine and Nathan's like thing. We just keep busting each other's balls about it. Yeah, don't forget about Tinder. Uh, Tinder. Yeah. No, because yeah. so, Tinder's, Tinder's not funny because it's straight. Like that's that's not easy. Yeah, that's that is us. It's it's like if we were gay, it'd be funny to say Tinder, yeah. but because we're not, we got, you got to go the other way. You got to be at least a bit comedic with it. Yeah. Um, no, it's a. Uh, where can they find me? Yeah, that was the question, wasn't it? So if you take on YouTube, it's uh, Lex Fitness. If you go on Instagram, it's Lex underscore fitness. But if you basically type in Lex Griffin or Lex Fitness on most bits, you'll find either my channel or someone roasting me on their channel about something or other. Yeah, but um, I mean, the, there's a lot of information out there. Oh, I also have a website, which is lexfitness.co.uk because apparently I didn't want any traffic to come to my website. So I picked a .co.uk name, <laughs> but that'll, that'll all be checked. It is there and I do have, um, I do still do, people keep asking me, am I doing coaching? I stopped doing coaching because I felt I couldn't give people the time that they needed for what they were paying. So I stopped. So because morally i didn't think it was right so, to keep doing that yeah but what i do still do on there and it is all me so if you get a delayed reply it's because you're literally talking to me um i have training plans on there which are um they're, they're not small they're like 80 pages of reading like every exercise broken down it's, so it's an in-depth thing it's not like a it's, it's a big thing that you get which breaks everything down and then i will do a custom macro target based diet plans so it gives you all your targets car uh, carb timings and all that kind of jazz to understand the food but you pick the food that you fit to your targets so it's you have to hit your targets making your food so it teaches you about your nutrition and picking your food and choosing it. obviously it gives you examples and all that jazz but it makes you accountable and then that's me again so if, if it's slow it's because you're talking to me and 
yeah oh, <laughs> i have to get back to it yeah right back to you but yeah um they're the places you can find me so lex fitness on any social and then lexfitness.co.uk perfect perfect and so the final question um, and it, it's, it's hard for us, probably for me to pick, pick a time in your life, but if you could go back to a time in your life when you were younger, between the ages of maybe 16 to 25, when, um, and I know you said before, you don't, you're not sad for more than three days, but a time when maybe you were probably the most confused, um, at a crossroads, um, at a real sticky point, knowing everything you know now, what advice would you give that self? The, the, one of the worst bits recently was losing my granddad. Like that sucked, but that was like last year. Um, that was that was hard. Like he was, because I never grew up with a father figure. My granddad was my father figure. So no, that's a lie. I grew up with a father figure, but it was my grandfather. So he was the dude that taught me, you know, how to be a man, how, you know, the, the rules of it. Like I said, <laughs> again, I said this the other day, like I literally, my grandfather told me, if you're walking with somebody, they walk on the inside of the pavement, you walk on the outside of the pavement. That's because that's what a man does. If anything, I was like, why? He said, because then if anything comes your way, you can push them out of the way and you deal with the problem. And that was it. And that stuck with me so deep that I literally feel uh, like, you know, you know, when you leave the house without your watch, that weird feeling. If I'm on the inside of the pavement walking with someone, I, 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 it makes me uncomfortable. I have to move on the outside. It's really weird. So um, in terms of hardness, losing losing like my, my grandfather recently was, was a big one. And it was mainly because I used to take him out for a, a, I used to drive. So I moved two hours away from him, but I used to drive up on a Sunday to take him out for a beer. And uh, he, he passed away the day before I was supposed to go and take him out for lunch the next day. So it like sucked. And that like nothing can prepare you for that, like losing something. Um, and the way... I dealt with that was like, yeah, it was really sad, really sad to lose him. And I felt like I didn't get to say goodbye because of it. And I felt like, because, and the worst thing was I, we'd rearranged the day. It was supposed to be the day before that I took him out. So that, that was like, do it, you know, I could have sat and cursed myself and um, been like, you, you know, and the reason I didn't go out was because it was thundering with rain and to take him out, he was kind of in a wheelchair at that point. He was 99 years old. Yeah, yeah. So he was, yeah. He gave no fucks about getting to 100 though. <laughs> like, whenever you said to him, like, you're you, you you going to make 100? He's like, mm. <laughs> you know, well, I, just, I don't mind, you know, whatever. He, and he had, his thing was, you know, if you ever asked him how he was doing, it was mustn't grumble. And I had that now tattooed on me here. So this whole tattoo was a memorial piece to him that I'd done recently. So that was one of my coping mechanisms with it. And I have his ashes in the ink of the mustn't grumble. So yeah, they put the ashes in the ink and then tattooed that into me. So I literally have him in, in my blood. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, and so I used, so rather than, and I suppose this would apply to any time anyway, um, regardless of the age, was I could either be really sad that I've lost this great man for my life, or I could be happy that I had the sheer amount of time that I had with that man, that I was lucky enough to have him through all my younger years, be so active in my life, teach me so many things and leave with me so many happy memories to be sad about. So it's all about the way you look at a situation. Look at the good in everything, like look for the good. If you look for the good, you'll find it. If you look for the darkness, it'll find you real quick, real quick. Because it's it takes no energy to be in the dark. It takes a lot of energy to find the light, and it also takes a lot of energy to be happy. And that's fine. I want to say that actually before we finish. So many people this year have come up to me, especially young guys, when we've done the fan meet and greets about depression, and I've never heard this before, other than the last year. People more and openly talking about depressive periods in life, and the little things that we say, like like I told you, say that dumb thing that you're thinking. Say it out loud to someone. It will make that other people who hear you say it will be like, oh God, it's not just me. And that can be enough to pull someone out of something. It's, and whether you're saying it that just to help yourself, it will help others as well. It, and um, so people coming up and talking about the depression side of things was, you know, I'd said something in a video and to me, it was like a, just a point I'd made amidst the many others, but it caught them at a perfect time and it landed with them and it stuck like the granddad telling me to stand on the, ins the outside of the curb and the girl goes on the inside. It stuck with me for whatever reason, real deep. And the, that, so your words can do a lot more than you think. Just, you know, say them out loud and you can do a lot of good with very, very little. And to understand that being, being happy takes effort is, is fine. 
it does take energy to be happy. And so don't feel like you're unusual because it, it takes a lot of energy for you to feel good because everybody is the same. We all have to work to feel happy. So you're absolutely normal and you're absolutely fine. So it, I think that kind of covers that point where you were going, where you're at a crossroads. Where look for the good in, look for the good in every situation because you'll find it. That is the best thing. It's all about how you look at something. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, the, the stories that you've told and the, the absolute gold that you've given, um, I love the tangents because they, they helped drive the points. And um, I feel like we could keep talking forever. But yeah, we'll, don't, I will, yeah. <laughs> hyper-focus, hyper-focus. I got you boys for seven hours. Put a kettle on. Yeah, you get the kettle on, boys. I love it. I love it. Well, Lex, thank you so much, no, man. Pleasure. Thanks for having and, me. And um, enjoy the rest of your time in Australia. Yeah, I'm going to try and not get burnt. Try, try yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Pop the sunscreen <laughs> off. It's a living rainbow, isn't it? Literally. Yeah. Literally. yeah. Rainbow. Yeah. I love it. Awesome, bro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Appreciate it.